Welcome to the Brain Warrior's Way podcast. I'm Dr. Daniel Amen. And I'm Tana Amen. Here we teach you how to win the fight for your brain to defeat anxiety, depression, memory loss, ADHD, and addictions. The Brain Warrior's Way podcast is brought to you by Amen Clinics, where we've transformed lives for three decades using brain spect imaging to better target treatment and natural ways to heal the brain. For more information, visit amenclinics.com. The Brain Warrior's Way podcast is also brought to you by BrainMD, where we produce the highest quality nutraceutical products to support the health of your brain and body. For more information, visit brainmdhealth.com. Welcome to the Brain Warrior's Way podcast. Greetings, everyone. Uh, Tan and I are here with a very special friend, Lisa Ackerman, who is the founder and executive director of Talk About Curing Autism. Uh, we actually highlighted Lisa's story in our new book, The Brain Warrior's Way, Turning Pain into Purpose. Uh, she was, uh, goodness, so many different things uh i think what, what i know about lisa is she has helped literally tens of thousands of people and it came out of the pain uh that she felt uh terror i guess would be another word uh, of okay. having a, a child that um was really suffering. So welcome. Well, thank you. It's great to be here with you guys. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. You know, one of the reasons I really loved your story for our book, um, when I, as I got to know the story and, and what you do, is because with all the people that we know with autism, I mean, the thing that is the the common thread, the common story, is that sheer, not just terror, despair, like complete lack of knowing what to do, mm -hmm. the guilt, the shame, the sadness, the, um, you know, the loss of dreams, the, the, all of it wrapped up into one and not knowing what to do for your kid. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that the, and it's it, sometimes it's personal. It's far you direct it upon yourself. Right. But you're like, no, that's not about me. It's that epiphany. It's, a, it's about this dear child we brought into this world. We need our job is to have him be whole, independent, fall in love, and be able to navigate his world without us. That's our job as parents. So I tell, love that. tell so, us the story so well, that everybody who's listening yeah, I mean, understands and, it. And thank you for the accolades. It's like, you know, sometimes, you know, what you do in life, it does, you don't pick it, it picks you. Yeah. And, and Jeff picked me as his mom, and I am so grateful and so in love with him, and he's just so amazing and so important. Um, and the thing that's just astounding to me is telling the story, we hear it thousands and thousands of yeah. times. So it's not just unique to me. It's, it, Jeff is unique, but the story and parts of that story are very same across the board. So what I see and what I saw in my kid was, you know, for 15 months, everything was by the baby book. Everything was milestone after milestone, check it off. And I'm kind of, you know me, I'm a documentarian. <laughs> um, I used to work with uh, GIS statistics and demography. So that's what I did for a living way back 100 years ago, um, which really seems like 100 years ago now that I think of it. Um, but, you know, so with Jeff and our daughter, Lauren, we experienced the beauty of having a kid and just the awe and the amazing and God giving you this amazing gift. Um, and, and then one day it just was taken away and it was shocking. It was scary. It was literally within an hour. He was a different human being. So what we looked at is, you know, did he have a stroke? Did something happen? Did but, but can I ask you, what does yeah. that mean? What happened? Did well, that you know, he was really sick on antibiotics, day four of a 10-day course. Um, I preloaded him with Tylenol. We went to the pediatrician and unfortunately had an adverse reaction to vaccines. Mm. So it was the MMR and varicella vax. That's not the case with everyone. I'm not saying my story is everyone's story, but there's, it could be an infection. It could be anything that happens within the environment that something changes. And I think there's probably a hundred ways to get to autism. 
our way was just that way. Um, and, you know, so I thought a lot of times uh, that he had a stroke and, you know, sitting down and confirming some things with you was really important, but I was afraid to look. Remember, you had to kick me and dragging and screaming. But our story yeah, started... I, think I offered it about 10 times. Only 10. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I finally I'm like, listened. Scan him. And I'm like, and then he offered to scan me and I'm like, hell no, that's a great mess. <laughs> Let's leave it alone. Let's just let that one sit there. But you'll get me one of these days. I know you will. He's a dog, your Funny. dog with a bone in a good yes. way. Um, but uh, the point being for, for Jeff is, you know, he got really sick. Okay. He got extremely sick. So projectile vomiting, no more than sleeping two more two hours a, na- a night for almost six years. Oh, um, my so he was up 22 hours. Um, there are many times where we were concerned for his safety. He would wander and be a Houdini, get out of any car, any car seat, out of the house, even though you lock the door and here's this short guy figuring out how to pull right. a chair, get the key, get the door open and get out to the park, but walk down the middle of the major street to the park. So, um, once we, again, sorry, I'm, I will come back to center. Um, so he was diagnosed with autism about a year after that. We knew something was terribly wrong. Um, so all this was going on before you got that, that diagnosis. Correct. You knew something was up. Uh, you just didn't know what. Well, I didn't know what to call it. Okay. And when I Googled back in the day when you hear the crazy modem, this was 100 years ago, folks. Right. Um, the modem went in and I typed in the symptoms that he had and autism came back. But I'm like, he didn't hand flap in front of his face and he didn't rock. And he didn't do other things that were on the list. But what we know is autism looks right. so different. Based Very on the different. individual. It's a completely different story. So we finally saw our pediatrician. It was a different pediatrician. Uh, our regular one was sick and out of the office. And she said, you know, let's just rule some stuff out. And I really appreciate that strategy. Don't panic and destruct the parents right then and there. Let's rule let's not stuff blow the whole thing out. Up. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I've, I just appreciate her more even to this day. We use it all the time. Let's rule stuff out. You know, and it just worked really well. We went in, got the speech eval, got the hearing eval. He wasn't deaf. Uh, the speech eval said instead of operating at two years, nine months, he was operating at a three to six month level. When I had videotape of him saying 10 to 20 words at the time of 15 months. Um, and there were other things that disappeared too, his smile. So on backwards. Correct. Okay. Correct. He regressed. So, regressed, lost skills. So that's why I kept thinking maybe he had a stroke. Something happened with his brain. There were obvious skills that he had that were no longer there. So as a mom, I'm always, let's fix it. Let's fix it. Yeah. I want to yeah. fix I, I, this. I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm a mama bear. I get it. <laughs> we're, something's broke. Great. Just tell me what it is. Yeah. Duct tape. Let's right, go. Right? <laughs> She's my kind of lady. <laughs> you know, I've got a hammer. Yeah. I can, well, anyways, the yeah. point being is, He's this beautiful little thing. We can't use a hammer. Um, right. But what we what we ended up doing is like, well, my husband said the most important thing. We saw one expert, and he said, your kid has autism. Uh, there's no hope, nothing you can do. Get some therapy for both you and the kid. And then in some time period, we don't know when, you'll have to institutionalize. So he basically left you with no hope at that point. Correct. And my husband and I were shocked. And then we went and saw other experts, and they said the same thing. And um, me, of course, I'm a puddle. You're talking about my dearest thing, my love. How dare you? Um, He said, well, you say there's no hope. We're going to be the best at no hope, and we're going to go see what we can do. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I I thought that was pretty fantastic. Uh, So... um, we just didn't want to give up. That's like the best line I've heard. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I, I attribute that to my dear husband. Wow. So. Um, the point from there, um, what, like you said, pain into purpose. And I just think that when you said it at our last conference and you made those words, I just was like, holy guacamole, that's it. Pain into purpose. And, and it, we had no intention of creating a foundation. We had no intention of starting a movement. And I don't feel like it's a huge movement. But, but you can't not do it, right? It's just that thing you can't not do when you see people suffering. Um, well, and as Jeff got better, I wanted every see, kid to get that's, better. That's, yeah. You know, and, and, and that was so important That's your to purpose. Me. So I, I looked at it like that. it's not just our family not sleeping. There are probably hundreds of thousands of families across the United States, the world, that aren't sleeping. So 
Well, looking at what we did with Jeff is we used Quest and LabCorp tests and we just kept running labs and we tried to normalize the labs. My husband's a kinesiology major. Mm. And so he's very logical and methodical and can look at the problem and read books and understand them. It took me weeks to read one book, weeks. It was him for a couple of days and he understood it. And I'm like, can you explain this in right. English? Um, he just was very thoughtful and let's just normalize the labs. And we kept hearing over and over, oh, those are just symptoms of autism. Well, constipation and diarrhea, right. throwing up. You know, tantruming, yeah, that could be a symptom of autism, but why is the kid tantruming? So, to me... Understanding like, the why. Right. And peeling back the layers of the onion, figuring out what the issues were. And as we figured out with good folks in our journey, including you, Daniel, that helped us, so... Even though I ignored you for some time, and I really apologize. I'll send you more fruit baskets. <laughs> um, but my point being is just we wanted to do no harm, find the things that would help him feel better and function as a human. I mean, he's still quirky today. He's still got challenges. Um, but he's in college. He's in college on his own, doing amazing things. His homework is stuff that I can't understand. Um, I think both so of us are kind of quirky. diagnosed at three. At three. With autism. Autism. Follow up um, with apraxia. Had a big regression. Correct. And what were the things you did early on that were the most helpful? What are some of the things you think most parents with <laughs> autism should, should do, should try? And this will astound some of the people because they know who I am today and food is medicine. But this will crack you up. My husband read on the internet, I heard about removing gluten and casein would be really good for autism. Maybe we should look into that. And I'm like, nah, -uh. you, it's my job feeding the family and you just gave me a huge beast. No way, we can't implement that. that that's all he eats. You know? And so we got in a big fight. It was hysterical. So today, me being food as medicine girl, it's kind of funny to look back. <laughs> right. So the first thing I did, and he said, well, you know, food, it, it, it's not love, Lisa, yeah. even though to me it's love. That's right. how I show love. You come to my house, right. I feed you. Yeah. That's my job. Right. Um, but my point is that's the first thing we did was we said, well, we, we'll feed them. We're not going to not feed them. We'll just feed them different things. Right. And the thing that woke me up, besides being mad at my husband, which was terrible, we got, like I said, in a fight, was um, why am I defending this kid's diet? He's right. Burger King chicken nuggets, Tiger Milk's bar, half gallon of milk, and French fries, right. and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. How is this a defendable diet? We took out <laughs> dairy, and he stopped projectile vomiting. Um, we took out Interesting. Wheat. So it took about six months to notice the difference with wheat because we made so many mistakes. We accidentally gave wheat because back, this is a hundred years ago, like I keep saying, where our food came from Canada, okay? Yeah. We would get boxes of bread that didn't taste like rear end right. from Canada because we did it horrible in the United States. Right. So our food would come and then I figured out, oh, he's got a yeast overgrowth. You know, he would get rashes all over. And so we would do labs and we treated the yeast. So these were the things that just slowly were bringing Jeff out of the fog. Still nonverbal, 15 months, and we're about five, five and a half now. So we started looking at other labs and things to do. So the, the most important things were removing food allergies. He had 42 food allergies. Oh, it was easier to say what he could eat versus what he couldn't. And I would put a shirt on him, if you feed me, my mom will kill you. <laughs> That's so funny. So he little Tasmanian all over That's the place. That's so funny. So nobody would dare to feed. They were sick. I made them afraid of me. That's so that uh, was I understand. That. <laughs> Food is medicine. Food is medicine. Now that now you can and order. even though you took away forty two things, yeah. there were like eight thousand other things you could feed him. Correct. Yeah. Correct. That were actually food. I mean, all of Tana's recipes are will fit. For gluten-free, dairy-free, corn-free, soy-free. Right, I've, um, I've created 400. It's basically yeah, an elimination really diet that tastes awesome. But, but it's funny, I had to. I just have to relate to you on one level here yeah. because when we talk, he always tells people I went from disaster to master because when I met him, I literally, I literally, when I was single, I had, I was, okay, I shouldn't even say this on the air. <laughs> no, come on. 
It's among friends. I used to have a thing of frosting in my refrigerator. That's what I ate on my way to the <laughs> hospital as a nurse. I'm like, I'm going to have a spoonful of frosting and I'm headed to the hospital. Like, no, I'm not kidding. Like, I'm, I was like, that was my crack. And so for me to be able to go to this level and, and go, okay, I knew something was wrong. So I just want to be able to relate to you on that level and go, you know, you can do it too. I promise you, you can do this. And and what I found is, you know, I got into my 40s and I started to have gastrointestinal right. issues and health issues. And so... You'd then, think I would have understood after cancer three times a long time ago. But, you know, it took me... I'm not... I'm a slow learner, so... Well, it was stupid. I got on my knees and prayed, Dear God, how can I help my son? Help navigate me. Help, you know, show me the way. And he's like, Great. You get it, too. Right. Thanks. Right. That's not what I meant. <laughs> yeah, because they do what you do, not what you say. Right? Exactly. Right? All right. So, so normalizing yes. labs. You normalizing can't labs. You can't change what you don't measure. Correct. You can't change what you don't measure. Getting rid of gluten and dairy. Correct. And then we found out soy and corn were huge problems. Yep. Soy and corn. Correct. 85% yeah. of the corn in this country is raised with Roundup. Yes. So, and, and it's, it's like, really oh, hard on your gut. it's safe for humans. Yeah, but it's not safe for your microbiome. It's, no. it's hard on your gut anyways. Um, well, and it's just interesting. And what else? You know, the other things that we went through and did is we looked at his methylation pathways. Mm -hmm. And this is how your body takes out the trash. Right. They were incredibly broken, incredibly broken. So adding glutathione in, mm -hmm. and we did different levels of glutathione for him, and he needed to metabolize it. So there are different ways that we did that. And you saw um, the study with N-acetylcysteine, which oh is one gosh. way to boost glutathione. So there's a study that came out last year. Yeah. That N-acetylcysteine decreases aggressiveness in autistic kids. And that stuff was like buckets of gold. So it was N-acetylcysteine, vitamin C, and glutathione. Um, and it was infused. It was an IV infusion because he was in yeah. such terrible shape. Right. And oral glutathione isn't. It doesn't it's not absorbed well. it doesn't, properly. Yeah, it doesn't no, convert. It breaks down. Yeah. And there's transdermal. Transdermal, there's a couple of products that are transdermal that are amazing. I mean, I That's go in a couple jobs. times, you know, like in the winter because I tend to get sick a lot after after having cancer. So I do the vitamin infusions yeah. and I have them add glutathione to it. Ten minutes. It's not a big deal. And it's the best. I do it too just to keep my immune system up as well um, because there's so many things we got to get done, right? Right. No time to be sick. Um, the other thing was is vitamin D. Um, blood level vitamin D levels for him was a six. Oh I was my a nine. gosh! I was <gasps> a nine. I was excited. I was almost a ten, like Bo Derek, but um, it was the wrong way to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> Total wrong way to look at it. FYI, which doubles your risk <laughs> oh of my cancer. God. Correct. And so, so everybody listening yeah. should know your vitamin D level. Correct. You should know it, like you should know your weight, like you yes. should know your blood pressure. Correct. So people who are listening are going to want to know like what it should be. So it depends. Doctors are different in what they yeah. think. My doctor, who manages the, my you know, the cancer that kept yeah. coming back right. likes me at between 80 and 90, which that's I think high, normal, but no, but there's new, even newer the, research that's, that's, that's that shows high. above a hundred is okay. Right. My so, doctor doesn't get freaked out about that. I don't. Some either. doctors do. So high normal is okay. I mean, how many yeah. of you wanted to be in the bottom of your class? Not me. Not me. I mean, so I like my patients to be somewhere between 70 and a hundred. Yeah. And uh, you have to be careful if you're prone to kidney stones. Yeah. Sometimes it can trigger it. Right. Uh, which means you be, have to be careful with green juices because they're yeah. loaded with oxalates. Uh, so I actually like have a couple videos spinach. on that because you're going to now get people sending me a bazillion questions. <laughs> I have videos yeah, on this on my Facebook page on oxalates, on kidney stones. So. No and worries. What's crazy is as you talk about the journey and what we had to do, oxalates was a big part of right. it. So low oxalate diet, gluten free, dairy free, and we had to go specific uh, carbohydrate diet mm -hmm. uh, to get rid of the yeast and treat with antifungals at the same time. On a low carbohydrate diet, correct. Yeah. So, so you you had a lot of challenges, but you did it. Yeah. And now he has, I think it's four food allergies that remain. Yeah. We can Because you healed his gut. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you can do that. I think probiotics were a big bang for us. Mm -hmm. uh, hyperbaric oxygen made a big difference for him because, again, suspecting stroke. So what was interesting was when he started talking after almost six years of age, it was like he had a stroke. It was, mommy, water, please. 
Oh, interesting. And he's not from France. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I did play some jokes on people. Yeah, we lived in France for the first three oh, years of his my life. Gosh. He got the I, I got nothing. Oh, um, that's so yeah, horrible. I know I'm horrible. Oh, um, but that's you got me jokes, right? Oh god. So um, many practical things. <laughs> and to to learn more about Lisa and Lisa's uh, just really amazing work, you should go to Taka T A C A now n o w dot org and you can learn about the journey if you have someone you love who has autism or one of the autism spectrum uh disorders uh, you just you have to know about taka they have so many incredible resources we're going to talk about more that more coming up but in the next podcast we're going to talk about a new study that uh, we're just publishing uh, on just about a thousand autistic kids. That's Stay with amazing. us. Zing. Welcome to the I'm Brain Warriors say. Way podcast. We, uh, Tana and I, are blessed to have Lisa Ackerman right. with us. And Lisa is the founder and the executive director of TACA. Talk about curing autism. You can learn more about it at TACANow.org. Uh, uh, she has been a warrior uh, in the autism community for many years. And it's personal. It came from having uh, her son who was diagnosed with it. And uh, she has literally helped tens of thousands of people. And what we're going to do in this podcast is we're going to talk about something that's actually really special to me, which is uh, imaging. In autism. Yeah, didn't you come to me five years ago or more that you said, we need to look at brains of kids with autism and write a study on it? And you were all wanting to get that done. How long ago was that? It was 12 years ago. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I've aged in dog years, so I apologize. I can't keep track of time. It was actually before I met Tana. Okay. It was, okay. Uh, My apologies, folks. Oh, it was 12 hilarious. years. Don't jip them on any of those years. Okay. Oh, that's well, funny. time flies when we're having a good time, right? Um, but I was just so impressed at um, you looking at and, and doing it so methodically and then seeing the study. I think I cried when you sent it to me. I was so excited. So... For, for folks out there, it's, um, hold on, there's a lot of words. Functional spec neuroimaging using machine learning algorithms distinguishes autism spectrum disorder from healthy subjects. And it's so incredibly important. Tell me about this. Why is this so important? Well, it's the world's largest imaging study uh, with children and adults who have autism. And up until now, there's been no brain way Right. to diagnose them, that autism is a clinical diagnosis. It's a diagnosis of symptoms. Right. If you have, and, and the three major symptoms are you get stuck on things. You mm -hmm. get the same thought in your head over and over. Mm -hmm. So it's the cognitive rigidity. You have social skills deficits mm -hmm. uh you don't read social situations properly and their language deficits so i have a question so i i don't clearly know as much about autism as the two of you do so i'm the odd man out here and for the people who are watching and listening i want to make sure that we cover this mm -hmm. um i have a lot of friends who are in this situation we deal with this a lot in our clinics but there's there's things i think i just want to know and clarify um I'd like to know the increase in the rate of autism. Yeah. And also, um, you mentioned something in our last podcast, Lisa, that I think is really important. Not all kids have the same symptoms. So there's like this spectrum we hear about. But what does that mean? I, like the, for a lot of us, we don't understand what that spectrum really means. Right. So help us out. Well, to hit the second question, then we'll come back to the first, Tom. Um, so I'm not avoiding you. Just want to make sure you know. Um, but for autism, what we say is once you see a kid with autism, you've seen one kid with autism, and the same goes with adults. 
uh, they do present so differently. And really, it's just the constellation of the same types of experiences that give you that diagnosis. So, uh, for example, instead of one kid hand flapping as a, a self-stimulatory behavior, another one may open and close the door. So it, it appears differently, um, but it affects you just the same. I can't stop them with my words, or I have to physically move them to stop opening and closing the door or distract them. I'm great at divert and distract. I'm like, that's my expertise, if you really want to know. Well, besides that, I'm making you dinner. But uh, <laughs> the point being is uh, it's, it's when they rise up so much that they can't learn in a typical setting. They have behaviors because of frustrations, which could be communication or not understanding. Um, but it's just the constellation of them all together that really equates to autism. And there's some great videos on the TACA website and also stories that describe different people's experiences. And of course, on about autism, there's literally all the symptoms. Now, you and I may have a couple of these symptoms. I think some of my OCD helps me get through and be successful, um, but it's something I can turn off. Right. I can go to sleep. I can have dinner with my husband and not talk about autism. You can shift. Correct. Most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is. But it's that, different because yeah. OCD is different than autism. Totally. It's just one of the features Correct. that when clustered with the other ones can devastate yeah. their lives. But, you know, the spectrum issue is it can be so bad you cannot be out of an institution Correct. because either of self-harm or harm to others. Mm -hmm. um, or you could be running Microsoft, Correct. right? I mean, the high-functioning... Asperger kids, although I know we've recently lost yeah. that term, which is just nuts when you think about, you know, how we diagnose autism and then all the names it's had from right. pervasive developmental disorder to Asperger syndrome. Uh, I think many children who used to be diagnosed with mental retardation are now being diagnosed with autism. It's just, it's, it's the nuttiest spectrum. Well, there, may be, uh, there may be some of that diagnostic substitution, but I don't think that explains, which goes to your second question, you know, the rate and the hockey stick increase. I truly wish autism was corporate profits for some do-good corporation. <laughs> I really do. Right. But it's a hockey stick increase, and we can't say it's diagnostic substitution to explain all of it, or we just know what autism looks like. I want to just take offense for all of the experts that have been diagnosing autism for 30 years. They know what autism looks like. They understand what autism presents as. It's like you can't miss it. It's like missing a train wreck. And nope, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to individuals with autism, but we can pick you out of a crowd. There's no issue there. Um, there's just more kids. So when Jeff was diagnosed, I think the diagnostic criteria was somewhere at one in a thousand. Um, and within five years prior, it was one to two in every 10,000. Wow. Um, when I was in autism. training wow. in yeah. the 1980s, when I did my child psychiatry training, it was one in 10,000. What is it yeah. now? One in 68 oh, U.S. children. And there's that's a more, insane. Yeah, and there's a more recent parent survey, but for some reason they don't trust parents. More that recent parent one survey, in 1 in 45. 1 in 45, one in 45 what yes, the heck? children. No, Here in Orange County, our school district, it's 1 in every 43 children. You just gave me, like, chills. So we right. have a survey So there's something so, we're so missing big time. So what is it? Because genetic disorders don't go up that fast. So I, I think mean, we're missing many something. of us think it's an epigenetic phenomenon well, where there's a gene pesticides or something interaction. Oh, I'm not uh, a scientist, nor am I a clinician or an epidemiologist, but there's something in the environment. It's environment plus genes that are playing a role. And I, I feel, I'm just horrified. Yeah, we should be horrified. You know, we should be really concerned. You know, if, if one in 45 had a special gift and they could function and do great things, we should celebrate that. But this is not something to celebrate. This could be one in 45 that need intensive help and the cost to treat autism over a lifespan is somewhere between two and seven million dollars per affected individual wow 
we can't afford that. As a taxpayer, it scares me. As a parent, it scares me even more. So to, I mean, that's a bigger story for a bigger day. And do I have an answer? No, but we do know there's probably. But but we have some of the answers. Yeah. Yes. I mean, one of the things because here we're going to talk about the study. Yeah, we'll come here. Right. We're, we're going to talk about the study. <laughs> one of the big lessons I learned early on is autism's not one thing. And that's right. what you showed. That some autistic kids have. Um, really healthy looking brains on the outside, but it's like a bomb went off on the inside right. of increased overall activity. So really which hot. Which is an inflammatory right. response. Right. Uh, and other kids who have autism, their brain is so cold. Mm -hmm. It is really low in blood flow and it looks toxic as if they were an alcoholic or mm -hmm. as if they had carbon monoxide poisoning or they had mold exposure um, or they had an infection mm -hmm. that and and so autism and this is what we showed in uh, all these su subjects nearly a thousand subjects wow. uh, you know from you know really young to middle age right. and what what we found is the classic autism pattern is their hyperfrontal, which means their frontal lobes are hyperactive. And so what happens when your frontal lobes work too hard? That's the classic OCD finding. Mm -hmm. It's in the literature. It's been published hundreds of times that when you can't let go of something, mm -hmm. your frontal lobes work too hard. So I think of the frontal lobes as the brain's break. It stops you from saying or doing stupid things that get you into trouble. But when it works too hard, it's like the brake's always on. Right. You know, open the drawer, close the door, open, close, open, right. close. And right. they just get stuck. And I had two kids once, a great example. They were surprised. Autistic kids do not like being surprised. They were. <laughs> if you want to be punched, go for it. <laughs> they were surprised on their birthdays by being taken to Disneyland. Oh, no. And in the Timon parking lot, they had three hour tantrums. And I'm looking, this is the second story in a week, different families, not related. And I'm looking at the child and I'm like, don't you like Disneyland? And he goes, no, I like Disneyland. I said, it's okay not to like Disneyland. You know, it's hot, it's crowded. Mickey's got his hands in your pocket. And <laughs> he's like, no, I like Disneyland. And the fact is it wasn't will-driven behavior. Mm -hmm. It was brain-driven behavior because things didn't happen the way he expected mm -hmm. for them to happen. And boom exploded simple things like taking my son home from school if i didn't take the same route everything that was within oh reach my gosh. was thrown at my head serious correct including stuff that i thought was out of his reach oh, thrown wow. at my head so i'm like oh is that the game we're playing great left turn for the next hour <laughs> oh that's so funny <laughs> that's how i like we need to life is unexpected you're gonna get a curveball. I get a curveball every hour. I don't know about you. I love what you said earlier. Um, we actually we, used to on Chloe's. Yeah, uh, flexibility was on her chore chart. Was on her chore chart. She's a little she OCD. Happens to be hyperfrontal. Um, the other thing we saw in our autistic kids is their cerebellum was smaller yeah. and less active, especially. And this that, is what we showed. Was that fairly universal? And it's 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 well. Nothing Statistically is relevant. Statistically <laughs> really important. The cerebellar vermis, which is right in the middle part, right. uh, medial part, the inside part, is smaller. Mm -hmm. I mean, it almost looks atrophied oh, in wow. our autistic kids. And, and the cerebellum is so important, not just for coordination. And many times they have coordination issues, but also for thought coordination, how quickly they can integrate new information. Right. So I'll look at a scan and I'll go, it's an autistic spectrum disorder child. But then what I, what I realize 
is they're not all like that. Right. Some of them are really overactive. Some of them are just cold. And so in the whole vaccination issue, right. and it's, it's an issue like if you say you like Trump, automatically people, <laughs> like they hate you and they'll throw stuff at you and they'll pick right. it. This religion and, over that religion. And if you yeah. say <laughs> that you should be concerned about vaccines, there's a whole bunch of people that will hate you immediately. Mm. And all I have to say is I've done 129,000 scans on people from all over the world. I have more experience than anybody in the history of the world. I have vaccination damaged scans. And it horrifies. Yeah, see, I don't actually me. care about people hating me. I care about the truth. Right. And, so, and so, I'm does not, it I'm not here does to be it popular. mean? And, and you, you brought this up in the the, the last yeah. podcast we did. D does it mean you shouldn't get your child children vaccinated? Absolutely not. But to assume that there is no risk from it is just wrong. It's well, it's it's wrong. Just open up the insert. It will demonstrate otherwise. Right. Just read the package. Read the package. Well, and, we, and I'm not going to get into this conversation so, of over but, vaccinating. But, but, but anyways, but, but the point <laughs> is, if you don't look at the child or the young adult's brain with autism, you are missing a really important piece of information. And what you said in the last podcast, which I really liked, is you started doing labs. Mm -hmm. And because how do you know unless you look? Correct. You can't change what you don't measure. Right. That's a business principle. Right. Peter Drucker said that. Right. You know, the famous business guru, you can't change what Peter. you don't measure. Yeah. And so the imaging work that we do here at Amen Clinics, it's all about more data. Mm -hmm. It's it's not about getting the answer. It's about getting more data together with the clinical history and with the labs right. that then can lead, oh, you have really low blood flow to your brain. Mm -hmm. Hyperbaric oxygen is a really right. important intervention. Or you have really high activity. What's causing that level right. of inflammation? And then we go and hunt that up. Could that be a mitochondrial? Right. Um, could it be an infection? Could it be a food allergy? We don't know unless we look, which I love that about you. <clears throat> we and don't like, know unless we look. We talked about, we have family members and friends that have kids with autism that had mold exposure in utero and throughout the child's first year of life. Different story, but same diagnosis. Different story, so, different physiology, right. but same diagnosis. Right. And how do you know unless you, unless you, look. you look? And that's what Which, I love about and, it. And MRIs <laughs> are often normal because mm -hmm. parents are panicked and they want to do anything. And w what I've always said, because I can order either one, is MRIs, I'll tell you if you need an MRI mm -hmm. by looking at the functional study. Right. If you have a hole like my nephew did, he had a cyst the size of a golf ball, and he was aggressive, and we took the cyst out, his behavior was fine. Well, I could tell that from the functional study. Right. The MRI, a structural study, will never tell you if you need a functional study because it'll never say things work too hard or not hard enough. It'll just say, is the structure right. okay or not? Well, it's in the standards of care from the American Pediatrics for Autism to get MRI and rule out brain abnormalities. So that's why a lot of families go out and do it. You check that box. And I think right. 95%, but they're so rarely helpful. Yeah, 95% of the families come back with a normal MRI. Thank God. You know, you want it. That's one lab. You want a normal MRI. But if you don't have a kid operating at, its be at their best level... Then what else can we look at? Yeah, it's and that's not telling you study. if it's overactive. And, and I would actually rather the standard be get a spec scan mm -hmm. because it'll tell you if you need an MRI. But an MRI will never tell you is this a toxic brain, right? Or how to is treat overactive, underactive brain? Right. Is this an inflamed brain? And that's why I fell in love with imaging yeah. twenty six years ago. Well, and, that, and that's what's been incredible watching your work for so many years and, and, of course, having my son as a patient, too. So talk to me about the autism subtypes. We talked about you know autism being so different for individuals. Um, what are you seeing in those subtypes? So classic, mm -hmm. hyperfrontal, right. small cerebellum, especially in the vermis. Um, there's a ring of fire subtype where they're not just hyperfrontal. They're parietal lobes. They're temporal lobes their whole brain is working way too hard for their age and, and for their gender. And right. those are the ones we think about, things like panda syndromes right. or other inflammatory, infectious yeah. causes. Um, and then there is the toxic subtype where their brain's cold. 
I, I remember my first patient. I mean, classically autistic. And, you know, the parents and I both came to the conclusion it was vaccination damage mm -hmm. for this child. But it's not everybody. No. Uh, sometimes if it looks toxic, it could be mold exposure. Right. It could be the chronic effects of infections. Sometimes, and there's a very interesting autism subtype. It's I call it the crescent moon okay. type. It's their right hemisphere is on fire. But their left hemisphere, not. And the right hemisphere is what reads social cues. Right. Right. So in right-handed people, it's the non-dominant the right hemisphere, it can read, you're happy with me, you're not happy with me, um, you're interested in what I'm saying, you're completely <laughs> bored with what I'm saying. I'm not. And, um, <laughs> but it's that right hemisphere crescent moon pattern that we've seen, which means for some people, we can interrupt that with things like transcranial magnetic stimulation. Right. But if you don't look and you do TMS on all autistic kids, you're not going to get a great response. Which leads me to my follow-up question, can you treat every brain the same? Well, if you do that, you're just stupid. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know how else to say that, but uh, it's, it's like giving everybody who's depressed Prozac. Right. Well, how's that been working out? Yeah, that's no okay. better than placebo. Well, I love what you said, Lisa, when you said we we didn't know what to do, so we just focused on normalizing the labs. Well, right. not everybody's labs are going to be the same. Not everybody's scans are going to be the same. Right. So if you're working on, you know, if you that's a great philosophy. You got to work on normalizing your brain Correct. and your labs. Correct. And to me, that's the most important thing that has been my frustration for years is. There's no one protocol. You can't do just one thing and expect the same results across all kids on the spectrum. Because we just talked about, mm -hmm. they're all different. Right. There may be, maybe environment was different. Of course it's different. And then their, their Exposure, ability right. and their strengths and their Genetics. weaknesses are different. Yeah. So we have to treat that individual. That's right. why. Now, I mean, there's I some it. universal things that I think are really good to do. I right. think putting them on an elimination diet, that just makes sense right. to do. Giving them omega-3 fatty acids, yes. optimizing their vitamin D level, right. optimizing their B vitamin levels. I mean, you know, there's some simple things I think really works, but if you don't look, you don't know. Exactly. And we want more, I want more information for my patients, right. and I don't want to guess. You know, I always felt like before I was just doing imaging, I always felt like I was Johnny Carson in Karnak <laughs> the Magnificent, <laughs> right? It's like, what let is? me tell you the, you know, what's the answer? And, and it's like, <laughs> no, doctors don't act like that. But it's why in 1980, when I told my dad I wanted to be a psychiatrist, he asked me, why I didn't want to be a real doctor. <laughs> and, you know, I'm like, who says Dad's that to very their blunt. child? Right. right. I mean, to their son, their offspring. Who says that? <laughs> right. But, but you know, 35 years later, I totally get it. It's because we didn't act like real doctors. Right. And that's why we right. were m made fun of. Well, what I hope is based on this study is doctors and treating physicians out there look at this and go, now I know I can help different kinds of patients by looking, understanding this patient, and creating a treatment path just for them. Dear God. So the paper is uh, open access, which means we'll actually post it Yay. on our journal so you can read the science behind it. It was done in collaboration uh, with the Department of Engineering at the University of Southern California. We're very pleased really with cool. our collaboration with them, also uh -huh. uh, with the University of California at San Francisco. So we had really high level scientists looking at our data and uh, we're just really proud of it and proud to serve uh, the autism community. So thank you so much for Thanks, tuning Lisa. in oh to gosh. the Brain Warriors Way podcast. Thank you. So we are back with our friend Lisa Ackerman uh, from TACA. We're talking about autism today. Lisa, you are amazing. I mean, you really are a warrior. We talk about warriors a lot and turning pain into purpose. And we have your story in our new book, The Brain Warrior's Way. And I just am thoroughly enjoying talking to you 
um, on this topic and what you went through. But you said something, we were talking sort of behind the scenes, and you said a couple things that I thought were really important. So um, you talked about acceptance and how sometimes it bothers you when people talk about acceptance because that's so different for so many people and people shouldn't feel bad if they come to it at different times. Yeah, and, and really it's not the word acceptance and I love and accept Jeff today. I love and accept all people with autism today. Um, I loved and accept him at his worst, um, but I know, I know that when he was at his worst, sleeping two hours a night, you know, poop smearing, having severe constipation and diarrhea, uh, projectile vomiting, um, misdilating pupils, mobile rashes, you know, that acceptance is not a strategy. It's not a strategy when you see someone that is sick and you need to help them because your job as a parent is to get them to the best possible place. So when your job is done and God takes you home, you have someone that can function on this planet. Not one of us will have a child and go, yay, I left someone behind that's going to need love and care from somebody that doesn't love and care for them. Right. So when I, when I, I love and accept humans, you know, I, I love my every kid, every adult with autism. The issue that I see with acceptance is when someone needs help, acceptance can't be your only strategy. You can pray that acceptance becomes more that it happens it eventually. Happens. That people are more tolerant to people with disabilities. I, I know people are barely tolerant, like we talked about with politics. How are they going to yeah. be tolerant with Right, this? and religion, right? <laughs> yeah. So I, to me, what I think is the most important thing and the most important job as a parent is to not be driven by anger and not, you know, but not be driven just by hanging low and not and accepting what is. You, you've got to find kind of a middle ground and a middle ground that will drive things forward, hopefully teach other people along the way acceptance and awareness. Um, but really your job as a parent is to get your kid to the best possible place so they can achieve their world's dreams. I'd say I love that. So I always say my job as a parent is not to be popular. It's not to be accepted. It's not, it's none of those things. It's not even to have my kid like me, yeah. right? My, yeah. my job is to turn out this responsible human being who is a good person, who's, who knows how to take care of themselves. If they like you, that's a really big bonus. But but what I loved about what you said is that in the case of autism, or, or I hate the word disabilities, mm -hmm. um, but let's just say challenges, Yeah. okay? Um, I know because it's, it's affected our own life right. with our granddaughter. Um, people feel so much guilt and shame if they don't come to that. They think that there's this, uh, it's like a, it's like a box you check off or it's mm -hmm. a, or it's this thing you're supposed to do is you, you have to come to acceptance at a certain pace and it's not like that. And mm -hmm. so they feel guilt and they feel shame and it makes it harder to do your job as a parent. Well, no joke. If your kid's having a four hour tantrum in target, it doesn't make you look like a rock star as a parent. Right. Um, totally get that. And I've been there, done that four hour tantrums in target, right. you know, that talk about don't yell at me a bottle of wine later on. <laughs> 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 don't yell at me. <laughs> Sorry. We, we are going to have that I know, discussion. No, 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 no. <laughs> this was a while back. I'm more mod moderated now. <laughs> but, um, hilarious. You know, but uh, no one looks at that as like, yay, you know, right. awesome. This is autism awareness loudly. Um, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but I, I think, you know, just to really bring it to center, and I am I was raised Catholic, so I know about guilt. Me right. too. Holy guacamole. I wear guilt. I passed oh. guilt 101. <laughs> Advanced guilt. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. And I always tell people, I'm all did you do something wrong? And they're like, no, no, I love my kid. And I'm like, well, then get over the guilt. You did nothing wrong. And I, it, it's just such a worthless emotion unless there's something you did wrong to be guilty thereof. Right. So honestly, that it's an emotion. And, and unless you killed somebody, you shouldn't have that emotion. You should not have, you know, that well, weighing you so down So rather than day. should, because that's a Catholic word. I know. It, <laughs> it's not helpful. We're shooting all over ourselves. Will this help us? <laughs> um, it, it it's helps no not one. a helpful uh, emotion. Mm -hmm. And uh, even if you think you did something But wrong. I just love what you said because well, it's about. Well, and all of us, quite frankly, have done things that are wrong. Oh, God. Right? 
I've done from, five things wrong before I got here. From what we <laughs> ate to what we thought. To, I mean, and most people who do wrong things don't have children who have autism. Yeah. And the incrimination, the self-incrimination yeah. is often yeah. horrible. Yeah. And it's important to have someone you trust to help you work Which through is what it. I love about your so work. So no, you know, you know, I always love... John eight thirty two, the verse in the New Testament, know the truth, and right. the truth will set you free. Totally. And the truth is, we still don't, we're still not sure what causes autism. Right. I mean, that's the truth. So you right. can say, I did this, that, and the other thing, and so did, you know, millions of other people do the same, this, that, and the other thing, and they didn't have a child Well, it's almost like autism. a Richter scale. Maybe that was a 1.0 on the Richter scale, not the 7.0 you're thinking it is. But to, to kind of parlay what you, you said, you know, there was one mom that came to me and said, I put my kid in the wrong school. And he was there for three years and she was devastated. Like she made the biggest mistake of her life, crying. Just, it was the wrong placement. Why didn't I make a difference? Why didn't I change it right I away? saw that personally happen with a kid at my daughter's school. Yeah, so I mean, you can insert anything into that. Well, and, and feel if you're ready horrible. to recriminate yourself, you'll find all the things that you did to fit the negative mindset right. that's that's inside. But one of the things I want to do, make sure we do before we finish this podcast, is I want to talk about Taka. Yeah. And, and what I, you I, want, I want us you to, know. to talk about why you started it, mm -hmm. a little bit about its evolution, and how it can help people now. And I want to know what you want us struggles. to leave with with how um, Taka can help okay. families. Okay. Well, Taka, the one thing you that. This is a common theme for a lot of uh, families that we serve over the last 17 years is that they lose their sense of community. When you have a kid with autism, it's just easier to stay home. It's easier not to go to church because mm -hmm. your kid can't be in the children's group at all. Right. It's easier not to go to the store with your kid. It's easier to not do 100 things just to stay home. And what I found is losing that sense of community is just one of the worst things that can happen to a family. You need community. Uh, to feel good, to feel connected, and you know that's to be the human. Way, yeah, that's the way we work. We're community kind of peeps. That's how we roll. <laughs> um, so really, what I think autism um, does is take away that community, and what Taka does is bring it back. Um, teaches you um, what information will help drive to effective treatments and therapies. Um, finding your peeps, if you will, and finding um, people that are really going to motivate and drive you. So as um, we would say, a tribe. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely a tribe. And I talk about the tribe all the time, so we have that in common. But I think the most important thing is the tools that we have is based on over 50,000 families mm. and what works and doesn't work. And what we've just been really good at is documenting those things, sharing them so you can rule things in or out. Is it in or out? So it's not that everyone's going to have the same experience or the same results. Yeah, so it's not about right and wrong. It's about does no, this work? No. And really what we just want to see is the best possible outcome for these kids. Mm -hmm. We want some kids may need help for the, their lives. Um, but we want them comfortable. We want them happy, not riddled with severe medical issues undiagnosed, which is a big problem in our community. Right. Um, we really want to drive people to effective treatments through the website, webinars, conferences, meetings. I mean, this month, tomorrow, we'll have over 100 meetings tomorrow that are occurring wow. across the United States for our National Coffee Talk Day. But really, what we want to do is just give people that sense of community, but the tools that are going to drive them to the best possible outcomes for their kids. So it's done that way through 12 programs and 700 amazing volunteers that work tirelessly to really just f pay it forward. They got help, so they want to give help back. And you talk about pain and purpose. They have it too. I mean, it's it's it, nothing is better than talking to a family that is absolutely devastated, having the hardest time, giving them some help, and then having them come back and say, my kid's better. Oh, my gosh. So to us, that just is like, I got to do that again. That's your that's your Let, paycheck. Let's, let's yeah. do that again. Yeah. <laughs> so the programs are driven based on personal need. What did I need that wasn't there? And then with our team, we've built other programs. So it's very much a team effort to to drive families to effective therapies and treatments. That's really what it boils down to. And to go back to one thing that you said, you know, what I hope parents leave with today is guilt, get rid of it. 
take that emotion, apply it somewhere else because you did nothing wrong. And for that family that had their kid in the wrong school for three years or, or, or whatever 58 reasons you're thinking that you did something wrong, which you didn't, stop <laughs> it, um, is to take that feeling and drive it forward in a purpose. Love way. that. Um, because it's pain to purpose. It really is so important. And it's, you're going to waste time. And then you are guilty of something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you could see your face like we, we can right now. It's hilarious. The Catholic Seriously. part came out. <laughs> it Come came on. back. Yeah, it did. It's That's that little mama bear thing I coming up. <laughs> But I just Bless really, me, Father, for yeah, I yeah. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> but I think the most important thing is to for families to know is there's hope and there's purpose. And there's and resources. There's to do. There are things to do. Get busy. And don't be afraid of the future. Be positive. You know, and that's a, kind of a, a hard thing about autism and a great thing about but autism. But you are full of resources for these people. Right. Okay. And everything's for free. For these families. Everything's free. And if there's a fee on something, there's a scholarship. Okay. So, so we can find tell us the website, how they can contact yeah. you, where they can get these resources for free. Correct. It's TACANOW, T-A-C-A-N-O-W dot org. Uh, what we will do is connect you to your local chapter or to a mentor. Uh, mentoring is one-to-one, -one, you know, connecting you by geography awesome. and, and by need. Um, and then we will help you on your path towards the best possible outcome, including recovery. That's, That's awesome. amazing. Thank you so much for being with You're us. amazing. Lisa it's Ackerman, my pleasure. founder, executive director of Talk About Curing Autism, T-A-C-A now.org. You're listening to The Brain Warrior's Way. Thank you for listening to The Brain Warrior's Way podcast. We have a special gift for you. It's an opportunity to win an evaluation at the Amen Clinics. All you have to do is subscribe to this podcast, leave a review, and rate us on iTunes. To learn more about Amen Clinics and the work we do, go to amenclinics.com. You can also learn about our nutraceutical products at brainmdhealth.com. Thanks for listening.